Hi everybody, Karen Fabian here, founder of Bare Bones Yoga, and thanks for taking a minute to watch this YouTube video here on my YouTube channel, primarily for yoga teachers, and especially yoga teachers who are interested in learning more about anatomy. So I want to go over something about shoulder anatomy, and this is a question that comes up a lot. And it is a good example of an opportunity for us to learn about the anatomy and then learn how to apply it. And this is a little bit of a kind of a trick question in a way, or I'm kind of, kind of tricking you a little bit because what I'm actually going to share with you is something that I want you to know. However, in terms of your cues, it's not really something that you're going to cue to. And this is really a little bit of a next level application of anatomy to yoga teaching. Because many times, as teachers, when we learn anatomy, we learn it so that we can share it with our students. And that sounds kind of obvious. Um, it's really a way for us to understand more about, about what's happening underneath the skin and then use that to inform our cues. This is really powerful for teachers because it's very different from just saying something that you were taught to say without the accompanying why behind it. And this is oftentimes why teachers enroll in my programs because they've been in programs, many of them for years, and they never really heard or learned or for whatever reason understood the why behind the cue. And in a lot of cases, it's because the presentation of teaching to teachers is really more directed towards say it this way, say it this way, say it this way, say it this way, without the extra piece that's essentially the most important piece. And so teachers are out there and they're cueing away, and then if someone asks them a question, they realize, I don't really know why the cue is like that. And so this is where the gap is, and it's a knowledge gap that leads to a confidence gap. And no one likes the experience of teaching, feeling like you're just saying stuff and feeling those kind of feelings of not being really confident. That shows up in a lot of kind of icky ways. And so a lot of what I do with teachers is not only teach them the anatomy, but also help them kind of undo some of those self-limiting beliefs that have built up over sometimes years of teaching in this way. And so today, when we look at the shoulder joint, what I want you to understand is that there are movements that the joint makes, and then there are movements that the scapula make. The scapula are the shoulder blades, and the shoulder joint is comprised of the scapula, the humerus, and the clavicle. Now, even though some of the words may be similar, we can describe movements that the scapula make completely separately from movements the shoulder make. So if I want to take the shoulder into extension, I'm going to move my arm up in the air. Now, if I move my arm out here, this is still shoulder extension. It's just not as much as if I take it all the way up here. If I have my arm halfway, you know, kind of even below half with the halfway point, it is also shoulder extension. It's just not as much as here. So the movement in the joint is described as a range of movement, right? And so this is how when you have an injury, you might go to a physical therapist and they might measure your range of motion, measuring you against what a normal range of motion is. So here we are doing shoulder flexion, shoulder extension, shoulder external rotation, shoulder internal rotation, shoulder abduction, and shoulder, ad, uh, I'm sorry, shoulder adduction, and shoulder abduction. And so notice that I have my hand literally on my shoulder joint to emphasize that those terms are anatomical terms, anatomical movements that are described from the joint. Now if I look at the scapula resting on the back, the scapula also have movements that they do. So if I lift my shoulder blades up, that's elevation. Down is depression. Um, closer to the spine is adduction. Further away from the spine is abduction. And scapula don't uh, externally or internally rotate like the shoulder blades, but they do upwardly rotate meaning that the scapula shift to the side with this bottom tip instead of pointing down shifting laterally and they also downwardly rotate where this top spine of the scapula tips downward. Now one of the things I want you to realize is even though I just talked about shoulder joint movements 
and scapula movements separately because the shoulder joint is comprised of the scapula, the humerus, and the clavicle, I can't move my shoulder joint without moving my scapula. They need to work in a coordinated way. And you will notice that there's a specific part of the scapula, which is this part that juts out here. This is the acromion. And I kind of think of it like a little awning. And it's an awning that's covering the head of the humerus here, as the humerus sits in the glenoid fossa. And as I move my shoulder into flexion, I can only get so far before the head of the humerus knocks into the acromion. And even though there's rotator cuff musculature there and different um, associated connective tissue structures, the bones are still going to knock together. However, the body in all its wisdom to avoid that limitation in range of motion shifts the scapula in that upward rotating movement, therefore tipping this acromion point up and out of the way so the head of the humerus can clear it, thus allowing the shoulder to move into full flexion. Without that coordinated effort by the scapula to move out of the way, I'd only probably be able to get my shoulder into this much of flexion, whether I'm uh, doing it closer to the midline, uh, flexion and adduction, or closer you know, or moving away from the midline, flexion and abduction. So, how does this all come out in cues, especially cues uh, in downward dog? So here, what I'm going to say is what I was saying in the beginning seems a little bit counter. Even though, to what you think, even though you know all this now about the movements, there are some actions that we really don't need to cue as teachers because they're just going to happen naturally. If you ask me to come into warrior one, my knee is naturally going to bend. Now there may be some cues that you need to use to moderate how much bending I'm doing. Let's say I'm bending my knee so much that my knee is way past my heel, creating a little bit of pressure on my kneecap and a not so steady posture. You might ask me to decrease the amount of knee flexion by leaning back a bit. However, the bottom line is when you ask me to come into warrior one, I'm bending my knee, it just is. When you ask me to come into downward facing dog, I want you to notice that as I bring my shoulders into flexion, because this is shoulder flexion in downward dog, even though I'm not reaching up to the sky as I am when I'm standing here. It's still the same movement, just because my relationship to gravity is different doesn't change the fact that it's still shoulder flexion. So as I come into shoulder flexion here in downward facing dog, you don't even need to cue me to upwardly rotate my scapula. My scapula are just naturally going to upwardly rotate because my body is tuned in to upwardly rotating my scapula as my arm, as my shoulder moves in to flexion. So that's why cues, in my opinion, to the scapula and downward dog are really unnecessary because the body is just moving in that way naturally. Now, what you could cue to, which is part of downward dog, is a little bit of external rotation. And um, I want to give a shout out to Liz in Ireland who emailed me about this yesterday. So as I come into uh, downward dog, I am moving the inner eyes of my elbows slightly forward, and that is creating a bit of external rotation. Rather than turning the inner eyes of the elbows in, which would elevate my scapula and create some internal rotation. You can pretty much see that I wouldn't want to be in down dog like this. So I can cue a little bit to external rotation, similar to this, except my palms are down, so I can't get it as much as this, right? The range of motion is less. However, the action of external rotation is still represented. As I come into external rotation, I'm using muscles on the posterior chain, the back of the body, uh, infraspinatus and teres minor, which are external rotators, part of the rotator cuff. So I hope this has been helpful for you. This is a really good example of understanding the anatomy, 
Understanding it so that you can know what's helpful to say and makes sense to say, i.e., you're not going to cue to the scapula and down dog because they're just doing their thing because that's how the body works. Versus actions you would want to cue to, i.e., external rotation, because you understand that in downward dog, you're going to want to create a little bit of that external rotation. So I want to tell you this in closing, which is to say that understanding this kind of connection between what you know about the anatomy and the cues you use is a really powerful combination and absolutely is the opportunity for you to come into your true uh, power as a teacher and to really teach from confidence. And I have a program, the Blueprint Learning Program, that is specifically designed to help teachers understand the anatomy, the key parts of anatomy, and how to apply it when teaching. And all you need to do to find out more about the program when I open it for enrollment, which I do a couple times a year, is get on the wait list. I actually open up enrollment more than a few times a year. I usually do it every other month or so. And in between, I'm supporting the new teachers that sign up. So it's not always available for enrollment, but you can get on the wait list and the next time I offer it, you'll be the first to know. So I'll include the link to this video here for the Blueprint Learning Program waitlist. And there's no obligation, just get on the waitlist and then you'll get my email and you can decide at that point once you hear more about the offer. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Please comment below and I'll see you on the next video. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss it. Namaste.